President of Ireland, Chairman of the WIT Governing Body, fellow members of the WIT Executive, friends and colleagues from UCC, particularly Professor Fennell, uh, organisers of the conference, you're all very welcome. And uh, I think this is a very exciting place to hold such a conference. The Economy in Summers and Society Summer School it's rather strange in, a day, in this age that you can find a place where there's no Wi-Fi and limited <laughs> mobile coverage. So I would expect there will be great thoughts this week here. Uh, it's appropriate that the subject that you're reflecting on, ethics, should take place in the surroundings that I hear originally this, uh, was built in the Middle Age and then went to the Renaissance and, of course, humanism and the thinking around um, ethics and the citizen and the, the role of the citizen in society really began at that period. So you're in a very appropriate place to uh, run your summer school. Um, I'd like to pay tribute to uh, the uh, team who put this together, Dr. Tom Boland, Dr. Ray Griffin, and Dr. John O'Brien from WIT and Dr. Kieran Cahon from UCC. I'm sure I said that incorrectly, but you know who you are. <laughs> <laughs> WIT is very proud to take up the President's Ethics Initiative. Uh, the school is very much inspired by the call to talk about how we can make Ireland a better place, particularly post-crisis. I think we made some serious mistakes during the crisis. We believe that one can define themselves by wealth and money. And now I think we understand that Society is a lot more than that, and when society crashes, that it's really its people, and it's what its people stand for, that's very important. And as we move forward, it's important that as the economy takes off again, that we focus on those principles. And this summer school is one of the environments where we start that discussion. Um, so I would also like to say that uh, the role of the student and the PhD student and the relationship between the PhD student and the supervisor is also very important and maybe a second uh, challenge is that we believed at one stage that investment only in um, science, technology, uh, maths and engineering was the way forward to develop our society but we now understand that Interdisciplinary discourse, particularly with humanities and social science, is a vital part of that um, environment and the uh, intellectual and the economic development of our, of our country. So this creates a space for PhD scholars to explain the work to others and perhaps most importantly to take ownership and responsibility of the ethical importance of the research. I wish the class of 2015 well. Uh, in their studies, and I wish the school continually grows in its success. I believe you seven or eight years now you've been going for, um, so it's um, well established. Finally, it's great to see WIT's role in this event. It is a real demonstration of WIT's growing profile in business and humanities PhD education. Well done to Tom O'Toole, Richard Hayes, Joan McLaughlin and Michael Howard. This growing profile reflects with expectation of independently meeting the requirements around level 10 scholarship set out in the TU criteria. With all that said, I warmly invite uh, our president to launch the school as a leading sociologist, poet and politician who continually brings to the fore equality and international justice and continually challenges us to think e ethically. President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins. Well, a guinea quarter and get out chesto, all has a ram velivs and shar fadagas tus and tiocht and shah, agas gallon and tocht and tiocht and if a torhuler level acadula, agas gane in avarice, le play brief and intellect tool, agas is mean la ma weakest a goal, lesh ne hagrahas and quid it tiocht, agas and cogol ek acadul shatavalt and shah yola. 
I will continue in English. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the relevance of my opening in Irish may become uh, clearer uh, in the fullness of what I, uh, what I have to say. Uh, later on today, I'm going on to the Waterford Gaeltacht uh, to open a, an exhibition of a magnificent new donation of a, of a very significant library to close the Narina, uh, which I'll be using the opportunity of speaking about the teaching and the present state of the Irish language. Uh, I think uh, it, it's very interesting as well. It reminded me uh, of a headline in an evening Cork paper uh, more than 20 years ago. Uh, when on the opening day of T.G. Carr, it was our most expensive white elephant yet. <laughs> it was about the founding of T.G. Carr, which has been such a great success. And that should be as a little quote, as it were, uh, to remind us that that what we describe as impossible or excessive may in fact be necessary. But I'm very pleased to be opening this summer school and bringing together, as it does, uh, scholars from across the humanities, social sciences, business studies, for a joint exploration of the theories, concepts, and methods that might better enable us all uh, to apprehend the rich interrelations uh, between a society and economy. And I want to provoke those connections a little bit more because sometimes they're suggested as uh, rather like the, the lovely aspects of Ireland, the case is, is our flair for paradox. Like uh, in Connemara, when people have visitors, and sometimes, and if you're stuck for something to say, you say, I suppose you like coming because we're fierce friendly. <laughs> yeah. uh, equally, uh, you will find in third level institutions in good days when people in staff rooms will say, we're hugely interdisciplinary. <laughs> uh, but moving on, uh, convened as it is by the Waterford Institute of Technology and University College Cork, uh, this school is in its second year, and I've no doubt in this very beautiful, majestic pastoral environment that, of Blackwater Castle, I hope it is propitious once again to your reflection and exchanges. And it is good to be in a place that facilitates quiet contemplation. I was delighted to meet the owners of this lovely place, uh, and I do wish them well too. As is acknowledged by the organisers in their prospectus for this summer school, one of the defining intellectual problems of our time is the consequences that flow uh, and that we can identify uh, from the hegemonic status acquired by one particular branch of economic theory, often referred to as neoclassical economics, as the principal, sometimes sole way of understanding economic life and thus informing policy making. And this is not an abstract issue for us to consider. We all must recognize that standing behind every policy, there is a theory, a structure of thought with as Golden would have put it in the social sciences years ago, domain assumptions, often unstated, taken for granted, that I suggest need to be articulated and declared. And once they are declared, then made open to contestation. That is scholarship. This is all the more necessary as some of the undeclared assumptions relate to or are derived from the purported essence of human nature itself. The dominance of a single perspective in economic thinking has consequences well beyond academic and policy-making circles. It has profound repercussions on the conceptions informing the contemporary global discourse as to what constitutes prosperity and the good life. Indeed, the invitation to view the world as a transactional place that is populated by rational, calculating utility maximizers has, I suggest, inflicted deep injuries on our moral imaginations. And I think as diverse as we were, diverse and interdependent global citizens, 
impacts on the way we conceive of our relations to others, uh, to the future, and to our shared planet. And one way I suggest that we might break free from such a reductionist conception of human nature, and I often think of that when I was writing about culture, about that suggestion that the fundamental paradox we all face is that our imaginations are infinite and our lives are finite. <coughs> and in response to that, most cultural strategies have been constructed in the history of thought. But if we are to break from a reductionist conception of human nature and social relations, and to, it requires re-anchoring economic theory in its rich ethical and philosophical sources. Now, I'm, as I say here, I pose to say again, I, I realize, uh, and I, you must relax, I'm not demanding this, knowing as I do, uh, the pressures that exist on PhD students. <coughs> I say it both as an experience and as somebody who has children who are PhD students and so forth. But I will return to that point. I'm delighted, therefore, that this a summer school was developed under the auspices of the President of Ireland's Ethics Initiative, and that your programme gives such a central place to the study of relations between ethics and economics. I note, by the way, en passant, that on your school's website, economics has been located within the group entitled Business, <coughs> together with management, marketing and finance, and I'm delighted to meet the representatives of these areas already, but separate from the cluster of disciplines that are identified as social sciences. And of course, this has provoked me into reassessing the status of economics as a social science. As a social science, if not as a craft, which I have taken to calling it, whose theoretical assumptions and methods of inquiry must be stated clearly. As the distinguished Indian academic and World Bank's new chief economist, Kaushik Basu, whom I met quite recently in Oris and Uthron, he argued in a paper from 1997 that economists should build norms explicitly into their models, lest they embed them unconsciously instead, and lest, I would add, we succumb to the illusion of economics as a pure science with the power of revealing some type of natural law of the market in the singular and with a capital M. Now, this, thus it is important, I argue, to, reconstruct, to reconnect economic thinking and ethical reasoning as it is to firmly anchor economics, its objects and methods of inquiry within the bosom of the social sciences. Now, speaking of Kaushik Basu, <coughs> as I was preparing my remarks to come, there arrived in my office from a, a former student of mine, James Walsh, had forwarded to me the recent World Development Report, Mind, Society and Behaviour. It is interesting insofar as it reveals a certain uh, crisis within those who have held to single paradigmatic thinking. Kaushik Basu, in his last work, I think, be, uh, Beyond the Invisible Hand, really critiques a game theory. But I think much more, much more importantly is what you have is a very subtle but not necessarily useful attempt to call it a volume, Mind, Society and Behaviour, which is to say there are a series of additional side roads in applied social psychology that we must tack on to our previous economic model, but it leaves the paradigm intact. It is one of where the paradigm in crisis and shaking looks to something that it might need to be refurbished, reminding me in practice, for example, of the ease with which the Business Council for Sustainable Development at the conference in Rio more than 20 years ago was able to incorporate sustainability into its rhetoric and off you went with an unchanged set of policies that were so destructive on the environment. And in exactly the same way, uh, this report leaves, if you like, the dominant paradigm of economics intact, but it suggests that you have had a whole series of behavioural concessions. It makes extraordinary concessions on page 25. Economic man is a fiction, not a reality. 
policies that assume the rational decision making will always prevail can go astray in many con contexts and may miss opportunities for low cost, high efficacy interventions. Updating the standard assumptions about human decision making is essential to pushing forward the frontier of development policy making. And thus, it, it, it describes, if you like, three kinds of thinking. Thinking automatically, and it produces this without any reference to cultural theory or studies. Thinking socially, without really looking at classical sociology. And then the third kind of thinking, thinking with mental models, which is the taken for granted assumptions that you have in relation to your proposal, which you have in, rela in relation to thinking. The title of this summer school, Economy and Society, evokes, of course, Max Weber's seminal eponymous work, published posthumously in 1921 and 1922. For what concerns us today, that is not just the profound embeddedness that I have been referring to of economic and social trends, but also their intertwining with ethics. Max Weber remains, I believe, yes, still an inspiring source. Indeed, the effort to understand the connections between institutions, identities, practices, values, sociality, subjectiveness, was central to the late 19th and, late and early 20th century writings <coughs> of such great social theorists as Marx, Weber, Simmel and Durkheim. My personal opinion that the neglected one of those is Simmel, who has so much to teach us. It is my profound conviction that there is today, again, an acute need for an integrated scholarship capable of embracing at once the social, economic, political, as well as moral and intellectual ideological dimensions of both collective and individual life. The current status of mainstream economics as a hegemonic source of norms and practices has been analysed by many distinguished scholars. Sociologist Michael Callan, for example, has convincingly argued that there is a performative quality to economics, <laughs> in that most social institutions favoured by economists, such as, for example, private property rights, are effectively ways of making values calculable and turning people into calculating agents. There is very interesting work on, if you like, everything on calculation, from the moments of cadastral mapping in the work of such as James C. Scott and others, which encourages me to say we paid a high price, if you like, for not having anthropology grafted in to the formation of our intellectual work. While many of his fellow sociologists usually challenge economists for thinking about the market in overly abstract terms, Callan contends that it is precisely this act of engaging in economic abstractions that fosters calculability. Economic markets, therefore, are embedded not just in society and culture, but in economic knowledge itself. Now, I could make a right comment that you should not have had to have to be awarded the Nobel Prize to revise your thinking in economics. But as I read back through those most recent recipients, including Stiglitz, as we know, there is now really no great confidence in defending any of the measures that are used to describe, uh, uh, to describe the economic. Yet it continues as a kind of residual in the backwaters of economic and policy thinking. By thus emphasizing the centrality of economics in shaping so many aspects of contemporary life, I'm not disputing the relevance of this discipline. I am quite the contrary, fully aware of the value of the abstract econometric tools and parsimonious modeling techniques embraced by economists in their pursuit for patterns that are widely generalizable and hence rendered all the more relevant to policy making. Indeed, as I am in County Cork, you remember the famous County Cork economist in the history of thought who said, I am not going to communicate any longer in words. I'm going to do so entirely in figures. So it, it is an interesting, uh, it is f very interesting to, that I make that point. Because I want quite, as I am here, and we're early in the summer, uh, to raise the point that those of us who are interested in philosophy and ethics and interested in the integration of scholarship are not illiterate in economics. Quite the contrary, 
I regard, for example, some of the practices that are used within econometrics as instruments. It, it, those who are interested in patterns of knowledge will know that they don't make, they wouldn't be sufficient to be a method, and they would be very far, far short of a theoretical paradigm. And there is nothing wrong with having good instruments, although I am concerned sometimes that the statistical measures being used simply are not consistent with the mathematical assumptions that are at the basis of the measures themselves. I frequently remember that in those days before I stopped doing empirical sociology myself in, the, in, in relation to those measures which I remember learning in the United States. For example, using measures that assume conditions of a sample and theory that in fact are not met, but are there in the end for a kind of quiet decoration in papers. One of the most critical elements of methodological parsimony derived from classical economics has been perhaps the paradigm of the self-regarding choice-making individual. Often simplified, as I have said, as a utility maximizing agent in neoclassical theory. Paul Krugman put it like this, homo economicus is an implausible caricature, but a highly productive one, and no useful alternative has yet been found. This may be true, I would, however, compound Krugman's contention by another of my visitor, Kaushik Basso's insights. The realization more than 200 years ago that much of the order that prevails in society can come about from individuals pursuing their own selfish ends was stunning. It was stunning indeed. It has rightly been epitomized in lengthy monographs and pithy theorems. But to go over to the other extreme and assume that the order and collective efficiency that we see occur invariably because of individual incentive compatible systems is to handicap our understanding of not just society and polity, but also the economy itself. Thus, parsimonious modelling and abstraction does involve some real gains, but also real losses. Thus, economists should always be wary of bringing back these strategic losses into the picture when interpreting outcomes, and also, most importantly, when advising policymakers. Behind every policy suggestion, Stands, stands some declare, some mostly undeclared set of theoretical assumptions. There is another way in which a reflection on ethics is important to this summer school. Over the next few days, you are invited, not just, I looked at the list of papers, which are very interesting, or you, you are invited not just to examine the manner in which your various research projects apprehend the relations between economy, society, and ethics, but also to discuss the values and principles which you as conscious subjects regard as fundamental to your scholarly practice, and more broadly, to our living together as a society. You are invited, in other words, to engage with ethical reasoning, not only as rigorous analysts and observers, but also as concerned scholars and citizens. I have to say, I have some experience myself of this. I, due to um, an illness in the family, I came back from the United States having started one PhD. Then I went to Manchester University and was in the anthropology department, where I came back to stand for election for the Labour Party. Then later on, as I was involved in another program, I, was, uh, I became a minister and so forth. Uh, I am, uh, my, some of my academic conclusions are a victim of my public life, I suppose. But one of the things I remember at Manchester, which was very interesting, meeting African students, uh, travelling, uh, uh, and when we would meet occasionally in the very bad conditions that were at Dover Street at the time, they would say, well, how are you, what are you doing? He said, I have all my data with me, uh, on the shows, I say but I'm just looking for a theoretical model. So we were looking for theoretical models uh, where they might occur and, and so forth. And there was a fine tradition in the scholarship as well, but distinguished anthropologists like Max Gluckman, who would say of Bruce Kaffer in his Wednesday afternoons, which he presided over majestically, you could ask a question, Bruce, you'd have a good question. And then I remember a lovely moment as well when someone asked me, Mr. Higgins, you must tell us some time about your own people. And there I was, the first 
Irish person invited to take my place among the Chosa and the Noor and the others. I, it was a, an uplifting moment. Uh, anyway, I must return. I think uh, uh, in this too, inspiration can be found, I think, in Max Weber's conception of scientific methodology as serving not simply as a guide to investigation, but as a moral practice and a mode of political action. In Weber's own words, the fulfillment of the scientific duty to see the factual truth as well as the practical duty to stand up for our own ideals, constitute the program to which we wish to adhere with ever increasing firmness. So the questions we are left with there are what type of intellectual work is required as will enable us to make all these new beginnings to which we aspire. Which virtues should academics cultivate in contemporary society? How might their scholarship address the great challenges of our time? How to imagine a better future and not be defeated by the present? It's very interesting to remember about Weber's own life. I calculate Weber gave less than 60 lectures. But you get the burst of energy he gets in the anticipation of war, which actually can uh, change uh, the writing. But we are now in a rather interestingly similar position how to imagine a better future and not be defeated by the present in the face of the deep pessimism that is currently prevalent in the social sciences. Such a questioning underpins this summer school's program, encouraging as it does participants, doctoral researchers, and I so wish you were, and I want to return to that point, and faculty alike, to imagine alternatives to our contemporary condition by exploring the, the neglected ethical sources and moral foundations of social life. I know that most of you here are PhD students, and it seems to me that this is a most valuable reflection to undertake during those formative years of your doctoral studies, years during which you're exploring a variety of concepts and theories, testing the boundaries of your research, and also sharpening your ideals and ideas and reflecting upon your role in society as scholars and intellectuals. And I wish you the freedom to do all of that. And I wish also that the great shadows of neo-utilitarianism be lifted from your practices, because this is so important. This is scholarship. And institutions that describe themselves as institutions of, of further scholarship must respect that kind of freedom. The titles of the papers which will be presented uh, throughout this week show that many of you are grappling uh, with uh, contemporary problems, and that is very important. I think that the questioning, as I said, that you're doing is so Im you're exploring concepts, theories, testing the boundaries of your research, sharpening your ideals, as I've said, and that is very, very important. But the papers, as I read the titles, the papers show that most of you uh, are interesting are to engage in subject matters that have an ethical overtone. Could I just at this stage say uh, on that topic, there is something that has struck me from different settings where postgraduate work uh, is undertaken, is the importance of us putting a non-Western value into it. I'm speaking of the role of kindness. I gave you an example, if it were, of somebody presiding over a postgraduate seminar all those years ago, uh, more than 40 years ago, uh, 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 as a kind of uh, master uh, 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 conducting a, a, a class. I think uh, there is absence of kindness in intellectual discourse. And yet where I have seen it, about where people allow ideas to emerge, and where allow confusion to emerge, mistakes to emerge, of being able to offer support. The kind of the, uh, the intellectual discourse that values kindness, the difference between, for example, insatiable intellectual curiosity with which people begin, and a kind of vulnerable anxiety as they seek to comply. These are issues you should address as part, if you like, of the life world of, 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 of researchers and scholars. And they are matters that are very important in the structure of the administration of institutes of technology, universities, all third level institutions, uh, it seems to me. And when we consider the challenges then of a word that is being used about uh, Ireland's recovery, 
Now, there's a term that needs itself close study, but it is clear that what is required is not just descriptions of financial adjustments or invocations for the lifting up of enterprise and innovation, all worthy in themselves. I argue not against them, but in terms of their insufficiency. There is also need for a revitalization of our moral and intellectual foundations. If it is to facilitate the emergence of a new collective discourse, a new set of institutional practices, where there is such weariness at the present time, a kind of atrophy, where in fact people cannot know uh, what the purpose uh, of, the, of particular policies are or how they read their role within it. That includes academic practices. But I want to say it would not be fair of me or anyone else to ask you as individuals to undertake the change on your own or indeed at your own cost, which is sometimes stated by people who are removed from the situation. You cannot do it on your own. We must together ask ourselves how we might be clever, how we might strategically operate so as to achieve the change required with subtle and effective measures. And that requires a kind of solidarity, an interdisciplinary solidarity of scholarships, recognizing the sheer beauty and privilege and joy it is to be able to have an insatiable intellectual curiosity. <laughs> we need a new language to address the manifold intersections of the economic and the social. New perspectives to manifest the large range of ties that exist between material and moral visions of human well-being. We need to widen our conceptions of how human beings engage with one another and with their collective future. I read Arpad's papers, for example, on the concept of home. I would add to that as well to say the neglected concept of intimacy. How do we move from these very, very fundamental relationships that move us from persons to places? And what are the implications of this as we construct alternative models? All of this is such an attract is, is so necessary. I think uh, we need, what we need to depart from is a reductionist vision of human nature as fundamentally self-interested. And to that, let us oppose the power of moral sentiments, such as the ones I mentioned, care, trust, that wonderful one, one central to the part of classical philosophy, friendship and the ethics of friendship. And let us respond then, too, to methodological individualism by reasserting the centrality of mutuality, reciprocity, and cooperation to the flourishing of our economic life. And none of this then in relation to practice, good accountable practice, requires the discarding of any of the instruments used appropriately in their limited context, but not claiming to explain that to which they are not directed. What is at stake is no less than, as anthropologist Arjun Apadura put, Apadura put it, the survival of multiple visions of the good life. I believe that this is an ideal worth fighting for, worth working for, worth sharing effort for. Is the Sulam to make an skull sarasha in a clock villa give an urmundlu intellectu, agas guim to make this sport to look for Torhalaki, a gahav neshaktana. I so wish you a fruitful intellectual. Happy engagement during this coming week, and thank you for listening. To me. And now I would like to invite our Pat's Scott site to give an address. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, President. <coughs> I think that we uh, at uh, UCC, Cork, and WIT uh, Water for the Social Scientists uh, really appreciate the uh, opportunity which is given here in Ireland by the fact that the President of the country is not only uh, somebody who lectured in sociology, but who also has a deep-seated interest in ethical and moral issues which are underpinning uh, the economy. 
I think social scientists very often have a kind of inferiority, inferiority complex versus uh, economists, as if economics would be a real science, and the social sciences are some kind of you know, watered-down disciplines or discourses, but the real hard stuff, real pure, pure science is in, in economics. And I think we are living in a times when uh, this assumption is increasingly questioned, and we have to do something really of following up what these assumptions are and how they are wrong. So this requires indeed a return to the work uh, and the thinking of Max Weber. And uh, it's not accidental that the title of Weber's big study, although that's a long theological story around that, but was still economy and society. So it requires some kind of collaboration, at least with these two disciplines. And as you indicated, it involves a number of other disciplines. First of all, uh, anthropology, because these foundations of economy, foundations of society, uh, um, are rooted at, at, at a kind of um, anthropological basis. <clears throat> so uh, how, to, how to proceed the summer school to a large extent will be around that issue. And of course, we are all rooted in various disciplines and we have our disciplinary background, but we still try to reach out. And that's the reason why in this summer school there are people who are from sociology, from economics, from business studies, <clears throat> sort of from anthropology. So we are. Try, trying to reach beyond. When in fact, I'm, I'm a professor of sociology here in UCC since uh, um, some years, almost two decades, but my background is in economics. I have a PhD in economics. I'm trying to breach these, um, breach these, um, you know, bridge these gaps, and in fact, it was my deeply felt a shortcoming or what I felt in economic theory which pushed me to be a sociologist. So as a sociologist and having a PhD in economics, I don't have terrible inferior complex with respect to economics, <laughs> uh, I, I must say. So how can we move, uh, how can we move behind? How can, how can we move to the foundations of, of economy? And I, I think this really requires to pose some questions which are related to morality, ethics, and their intellectual uh, foundations. You repeatedly emphasized in your discourse, and in a way, I know very well how much I have to cut down on time. I, ju I just want to indicate that there are so many things that could be discussed, and I have to really pick up just a few of them. And one of the most important was this deep-seated need to revisit the intellectual foundations of, of, of economics, uh, economic thinking, just as society and, uh, and moral thinking. So what, what are these, uh, what are these um, foundations? How can we... How can we go and think about in a different way than, let's say, economic theories, think about the homo economicus and this kind of, this kind of models? Now, in terms of the anthropological foundations, it is interesting that you mentioned about Manchester and that you had your studies in anthropology in Manchester, because one of the main figures that I'm using in getting to these foundations actually also studied with Manchester with Max Gruckman, and he was Victor Turner who yes. by that time moved to, to Chicago, but still his, his work on, uh, on, on liminality is one of the ways to, to understand what are the conditions uh, under which certain kind of intellectual development can happen, which then become something like solidified or even ossified into the foundations of, of thinking. And Max Weber, although he lived way before modern anthropology was uh, uh, established, was always trying to look back for this kind of quasi-anthropological foundations. In fact, some, some of the best interpreters of Max Weber, like Wilhelm Hennis, are specifically trying to bring out these anthropological foundations under the ideas uh, of, of, of Max Weber. So uh, let me just mention a few of these uh, foundations towards uh, uh, or, or kind of revisiting of the foundations. So this thinking about ethics, thinking about morality is in my reading and following uh, your suggestions, not just about norms, which would be sort of like abstract norms, which philosophers would define about pure reason. In a way, the pure reason is just as problematic that pure economics and pure reason and pure economics are very much connected. They're not even just about rights, which is again a fundamental category, but a legal category. But they somehow must require an understanding of the anthropological foundations behind norms and rights and things like that. And I think a central issue is the concreteness of ethics, the concreteness of morality. That it, it refers to concrete human beings who have their concrete communities and concrete tradition, and this 
concreteness is very fundamental. The moment in which we leave concreteness and raise uh, up at the level of general ideas and ideals and norms, we lose these foundations which should be and which can only be the foundation of a decent and meaningful uh, human life. And, and this is maybe the last word by which I have to uh, finish my talk, is to revisit the question of meaning and meaningful life in this, uh, in this context of, um, um, of, of concreteness. This arguably is one of the biggest problems in economic theory. There is no concreteness in economic theory. All these rational calculations and supposed interest definitions, and interest, by the way, is a word which, if you trace it etym etymologically, it has no concreteness about that, because interest simply means interest, to, so to be in between. So interest is the least concrete word that can be. To talk about objective interest is a contradiction in terms. So instead of being always in between interest, uh, how to be concrete, how to find a stability at the level of personality, at the level of concrete human life, at the level of concrete communities and concrete traditions, which of course are manifold, and that's why we then go back to the different kind of reasoning, different kind of rationalities, different conceptions of the good life. There should not just be one good life that is clearly untenable, and the economics have that uh, behind their ideas, which is quite a questionable what kind of good life can come out of that. So how to rethink meaning and how to rethink the conditions of a meaningful life, this is fundamentally an intellectual uh, work to do where we sort of have to get rid of our own intellectual uh, assumptions because very often we think that we as academics or intellectuals or philosophers or sociologists know things better than people know in their everyday life and in fact that is pre basically the most dangerous hidden assumption underlying all this kind of abstract theorizings which then led to the kind of economic theory and its assumptions which then led into the current state of sort of <coughs> crisis, a very deep-seated crisis, which forces us to rethink the foundation. So thank you very much, uh, President, that you gave an opportunity to, to think about these uh, terms and receiving your sort of seal of approval as humble sociologist and economist. Thank you very much. Okay, so very interesting and this huge food for thought and just like to thank very much again President Higgins for opening the event and really giving us this kind of deep, deep themes to really think about. So just what I'd like to do now just as a gesture of appreciation, a very humble gesture is just to provide a gift of some of our works. So there's a, we have a, a lot of reading. <laughs> 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 so, I can carry some of them. Thank you very much. Ah, yes, very good. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, now I would like to invite everybody to join us for some tea and conversation and coffee and biscuits in the room down here. And um, again, thank you very much. All right.